How do you go back? Oh, okay, right. Hi everyone, my name is Adil Ahmed and I'll be presenting our paper, Obfuscator, uh, Commodity Obfuscation Engine on Intel SGX. Uh, so that's me, uh, Adil Ahmed, and Byonggil Jo. We share equal honors for this paper. Our collaborators, Yuan Chao, Inchian Zhang, Insection, and Byonggil Lee. This is a joint collaboration between Purdue University, KAIS, the Ohio State University, and Seoul National University. Uh, so to understand the premise of my paper, it's imperative we first understand the concept of program obfuscation in a systematic sense. So uh, consider that uh, a user has a private program that we're just going to call pprif uh, that has some proprietary internal information. So the user wants to offload this program onto the cloud, but it, the user does not want the cloud provider to actually figure out the internals of this program or the uh, proprietary information from this program. So what the user does is encrypts the program and sends it to the untrusted uh, system. Um, here the attacker can run this uh, encrypted program in some sense with whatever input he or she wants. And, uh, but the caveat is that the attacker has, or the, the cloud provider has to run this uh, in a black box within any untrusted system. Now what is, the, what is the goal of the attacker here? The attacker wants to disclose the internal information of the program. Uh, but if the black box in this scenario is secure, what would that mean? Uh, it would mean that after a constant time t, the black box would give a correct output to whatever program that was running and whatever input we provide, uh, the attacker provided to the program. But also, if there are any observable execution traces that come out from this black box, they would be completely, they, they, they should not leak any information about the internal um, algorithm or the internal information that is stored in this private program. Uh, so this is program obfuscation. Now a lot of you might be thinking, wait, this is very similar to something that we've heard called Intel SGX. Like that's what Intel SGX does. So let's, uh, let's, let's try to revise what Intel SGX does. So, in, uh, so you have a regular program. Intel SGX divides the program into two different parts. One is the enclave part and the other is the non-enclave part. What is the difference? The enclave part is called the trusted execution region where you can store uh, where, uh, your code and data, your sensitive code and data. Um, it, there, there are a few confidentiality and integrity guarantees provided by the enclave. Now, what does that mean exactly? That means that the operating system and other untrusted software that's running on the system can't directly access the enclave memory because it's restricted by the processor. Um, and in a perfect world, this is exactly what program obfuscation should be. This is exactly what we need. But we don't live in a perfect world. Intel SGX is not perfect. There are a lot of papers that have shown that Intel SGX leaks a lot of side channel information. So just to revise that again, so you have an enclave, whatever memory is inside the enclave, whenever you access, whenever the program performs some memory access onto the enclave, it leaves visible traces on the untrusted and shared components. Uh, what are those components? Of course, the page tables, which are controlled by the operating system, the CPU cache, the branch target buffer, or the branch predictor units, and of course, it leaks timing information. Uh, and the operating system being so powerful, it can look into all of this. So with a page table attack, you can figure out up to the granularity of each single page what was accessed by the enclave. The CPU cache, of course, has a granularity of 64 bytes, which is one cache line. So, based, uh, so up to 64 bytes, you can figure out what the enclave accessed. The branch target buffer or, or the branch predictor units store each source and destination of, the, of branches. So you can figure out whatever uh, branches were taken by the program. Uh, um, and the last thing is timing. So just to, keep, just to make it, keep it simple, we can, we can assume that the timing is the execution time of the program, which would also leak some information. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, existing papers that talk about each of these attacks in particular. Um, also, there are a lot of papers that talk about um, solutions to these attacks. So let's just, let's just learn a little bit from the existing solutions. So we have access pattern attacks, which are page table, cache, and branch prediction attacks. So one of the existing solution is using transactional memory, or Intel DSX, uh, to create uh, side channel secure programs, uh, secure against page fault and cache attacks. Um, those are, the problem with those papers is that they, they can't solve all of the existing side channels within Intel, S, uh, within Intel SGX. Um, another solution that was recently proposed was cache partitioning, but cache partitioning is a good solution, but it doesn't, it, it requires ring zero privileges, which aren't, which is basically the operating system level privilege, which the enclave does not have. Another possible solution is to randomize the address, uh, which is also proposed, but the problem is that's a probabilistic defense, it's not deterministic enough. 
Um, so the first lesson we learned from here is that ring, like the enclaves themselves, it's really hard for them to hide the access patterns because they're not privileged enough for one. Um, so that's the first lesson we, we learned from the existing solutions. So now let's just talk about timing attacks for a little bit. So timing, so this very, the simplest way of fixing timing attack is let's suppose that we uh, fix the execution time of each program that runs inside an enclave. But the problem is that an enclave does not have a reliable timer. So you could use RDTSC, or you could use network timers, or you could use thread timers, but the problem is they're all controllable by the operating system, which in our scenario is the attacker. So the second lesson we learned from all this is that, okay, SGX does not even have a reliable timer in some sense. So we, don't ha so we should not rely on external timers. Um, so these are the two solutions we, uh, so these are two lessons we learned from this. So let's now talk about our approach. Now from these lessons, we, we come up with, with another idea. We say, okay, what if we create indistinguishable enclave programs? What does that mean? So consider a hypothetical program where there's a code block, you have a specific code block that's executed from a fixed location for a number of time, for an n number of time on a fixed location called the CPAD, and it performs a single data access, it could be stack, it could be heap, uh, on, on a fixed location again, which is the DPAD. Both of these are 64 bytes in size. Just to illustrate this point, there's the CPAD over here and the DPAD, which are both 64 bytes, which is one cache line, and there's a single data access from a fixed location in the CPAD, and there's a branch to the start of the CPAD after it executes. You can think of it as a simple for loop, for example. And this would happen for n executions. So this, is, this, this, this sort of program runs in the same fashion for n number of times. So let's, let's think about what does this sort of a program reveal to the attacker? So if we perform a paging attack, the program is just revealing the same page over and over again. If you perform a cache attack, it just reveals the same cache line again and again. A branch attack, there's only a single branch, and you would have the same branch again and again and again. And timing attack, because assuming that each CPAD executes the same, uh, takes the same amount of time to execute, and n would take the same amount of time to, uh, n times the amount of time to execute. So e the timing would also be the same. So irrespective of whatever program is in the in the CPAD executing, if it would reveal the exact same traces uh, to the attacker. So this is the key takeaway from here. So instead of the enclave trying to hide the traces, we should design enclaves that, ex that just show the same traces over and over again. Um, so this is the key takeaway from our approach, which is different from uh, what existing solutions have done. So uh, if you didn't understand the last part, and of course, since I'm a big Harry Potter fan, um, let Hermione explain this concept to everyone. So let's assume that the, there is an operating system that runs to the end. On the system, you have two different uh, enclaves. Um, th since these enclaves are different, the patterns that they're going to show are also slightly different. So at the very least, uh, the operating system can figure out that, OK, these are different programs. At the very least, that's what you can figure out. But of course, Hermione being the best witch of her time, she comes up with a solution which we'll just call obfuscure, which is basically a spell. And what would happen afterwards is that both these programs are, execute, are exhibiting the exact same memory traces and the operating system, of course, is crying because, uh, because there's no information leak from this sort of a design. Um, so, uh, okay, now everyone's like, okay, that makes sense, but what's the challenge with this? Something, this, this looks like maybe it would be very similar to um, actually make. Uh, let's consider a very simple solution here. So let's have a software translator. Let's copy all the code and data onto the CPAD and DPAD and just get done with it. That's it. Okay, let's assume something like this. You have an enclave storage, you have the translator, you have the CPAD, and you have the DPAD. Here, um, the translator is going to copy all the code onto the CPAD and the data onto the DPAD. But the first problem that we're going to come up here is the native code is just not in 64-byte blocks. The native code has different sizes, and it's not in a fixed uh, size. Uh, that's the first challenge you would come up, uh, and then you would have a compatibility issue. If somehow you fix C1, you would have another challenge. When you actually copy the code from the enclave storage, you would be leaking access patterns while you're copying it onto the CPAD, or you're copying data onto the DPAD. If you solve C1 and C2, you'd still have another issue. The problem is that the code that you would load onto the CPAD, uh, C CPAD would have uh, different branch instructions at different locations, which would leak some information through branch prediction attack. 
And if you're able to fix all of these issues, you would st we still haven't even discussed timing issues. So uh, these are the main challenges while uh, trying to solve this, this issue. And I'm going to explain how we do this one by one, how we solve these challenges one by one. So Obfuscuro is a is program obfuscation on Intel SGX. So the entire idea is that all the programs should exhibit the same pattern irrespective of their logic or irrespective of whatever input is actually provided to the program. So it's been adapted from a Harry Potter spell, which is Obscuro, which literally, uh, which, is, which has a Latin translation of darkness. Um, so the first challenge, of course, was to enforce code blocks of identical sizes, because we want all the code blocks to be 64 byte. So what we do is we break the code blocks into 64 bytes and use NOP instructions to pad them. So you have, an, uh, you have a native foo, a foo code block, which is 90 bytes. You pass it through the Obfuscuro compiler, and it's just going to split foo into two different parts, foo1 and foo2. Foo1 is 64 bytes, and foo2 is 64 bytes with 38 bytes of padded um, NOP instructions. So that's, that's simply what we do. So the first thing, so the first key takeaway is that you create code blocks that are all identical in size. That's the first thing. And they all have to be 64 byte because that's one cache line and that's the size of our CPAD. Um, so they can now be loaded onto the CPAD. So the second part is now you can load them onto the CPAD, but you still can't do them securely. So if you want to securely load them onto the C or D pad, you have to use uh, something, a cryptographic uh, primitive called oblivious RAM. So the code and data is loaded onto the C and D pad, uh, respectively. So consider this, you have the C pad, you have the code controller, and you have the ORAM tree. So you execute the old code block, and then you request a new code block from the code controller, which retrieves the code block using ORAM. ORAM is going to ensure that there is no access pattern leakage. And then uh, the instrumented code, of course, is, is located inside the C tree. And then you update the CPAD with, with the new code block, and you start executing the new code block. So, so the side channel resistant ORAM scheme ensures that there is no leakage as C or D pad are loaded. Uh, that's C2, that's solving C2. So now go, trying to solve C3, branch prediction issues. So now we have to align all the branches that, that are f to or from the CPAD. So each instrumented code block, uh, which has been instrumented using our compiler, has two branches to fix locations, C, from the CPAD to code controller and to the data controller. So we have a CPAD, we have two jump instructions, one at the start uh, that goes to the data controller to fetch some data, and we, and we have another jump to, for, from the CPAD to the, code uh, to the code controller to fetch the new code block that has to be executed. So that, so, and the C and D controller, of course, has no conditional branches because there's a side channel resistant implementation that we just talked about. Um, so all Obfuscuro programs execute the same sequence of branches. So irrespective of whatever program has pa been passed through the compiler, we're going to have the same sequence of branches. Um, so, so the last part here is ensuring uh, execution time consistency. Uh, of course, the program, so what we do is we make sure each program fi executes a fixed number of code blocks. So again, we have the CPAD, we request the next code block, and we retrieve the next code block, but the ORAM tree already has dummy code blocks. So when the program has executed all its code blocks, all its real code blocks, it is going to execute dummy code blocks, but, are, but, but the code blocks are completely indistinguishable from each other from a memory perspective. And it's going to either return to the CPAD, or if it's executed n blocks already, it is going to return to a predefined function or a predefined location, and it's just going to fetch the output and exit from the enclave. So each program is going to run n number of code blocks, which is a, a limit that's, can be, that can be defined by the user, and then it's going to return to the same location and fetch the output and return the output. So we're going, we're going to execute n code blocks to ensure that all programs uh, terminate consistently. Um, and of course, the assumption is that each CPAD takes the same amount of time. Um, so uh, now we're also going to talk about faster memory stores for Enclave. This is just an optimization in, in our paper, uh, where, uh, which, where we talk about, because uh, the memory itself is untrusted and it leaks access patterns, but you can use AVX registers so, um, so if you use a DRAM-based store, you have to access each, se each index sequentially to actually be secure. But if you just access the registers, you can access them individually. So this is just a faster oblivious storage, but a very small storage that we use for ORAM stash uh, that you can learn more about in the paper. Uh, so the implementation uh, is threefold. We have the LLVM compiler suite, which breaks the code and instruments it. 
We have a runtime library which initializes the ORAM and terminates the program. And we have some modifications to the SDK just to create memory regions, uh, extra memory regions. So the performance evaluation, uh, so we, we ported uh, 10 simple applications to obscure something similar as uh, some programs, palindrome, binary search, uh, matrix transpose, et cetera. So the overhead is pretty high because we're using ORAM, but um, that's expected because of the high guarantees uh, that we're providing. So the average overhead is 81 times over the native program. Um, but this is still faster, much faster than existing cryptographic solutions, uh, of course. Uh, but also one caveat is that the overhead is highly dependent on the input size and the program that you run. Um, and the program uh, size because it might be executing more code blocks or less based on uh, whichever program it is. So uh, just, just for ending remarks, the first thing is program obfuscation is a remarkable dream to achieve. It's something that we should think, be thinking about. In trusted execution, this is, this is what we want. We, we, we don't want a side channel um, prone system. We want a, a system that can guarantee us these, uh, these guarantees. Um, but the problem is that Intel SDX has a lot of software and hardware limitations which hinder the realization of this dream. And the existing solutions have a limited approach because they try to solve individual side channels rather than solving all of the side channels together. Um, Obfuscator is a compiler-based scheme, of course, which addresses these um, issues. And we, the key takeaway is that we ensure all programs leak the same access patterns. Uh, so thank you so much. That's uh, thank you in Urdu, and that's thank you in uh, Korean. So thank you so much, and I'll take questions now. If you have questions, feel free to come to the mics. So for the time being, uh, I have one question. Yes, please. So I think you mentioned it in your paper, but uh, is it, uh, is it, does it defense against uh, recent attacks like Spectre and Meltdown? Do you, do right. Oh, sorry. Uh, so Spectre and Meltdown are, in, 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 uh, are not the, in the scope of our uh, paper, but we, because we're trying to stop access pattern attacks and not, and the assumption is that the black box is only leaking access patterns, but using Spectre or Meltdown or the foreshadow attack, you can somehow extract the actual information from the enclave. You can directly read, uh, read the contents, which is not the scope of this paper. Question? Yeah. Um, are you aware of this work called Raccoon? Raccoon on Usenix, right. I think 2015. Yes. Um, can you compare your work with Raccoon? Oh, right, absolutely. So Raccoon talks about side channel obliviousness. So there's a difference between side channel obliviousness and program obfuscation in particular. So Raccoon ensures that the program um, is going to run, let's say the program has two different branches. It is going to run both those branches and it's going to execute both the branches and access all the data in those branches, for example. But it would, but consider a program that has, let's say just two branches and a program that has just one branch. Raccoon would still at least leak the information that this program and this program are different because Raccoon's not designed to, you know, obfuscate all the programs. It's just designed to not leak the data from a public, for example, a public program. But what we're considering here is a private program which, wants, which also wants to make sure that, you know, you can't even leak the information whether this program is different from the other program. So that, that's the key difference between these two systems. And my second question is, yes, uh, how realistic is it that each C block executes the same uh, amount of time? You know, right. Given the out -of so, execution and absolutely, that's a very good question, and I actually have a slide for that. I think so. Yes, I do. Uh, so yeah, that's a very good question. We, we, did a, so we did a statistical experiment by creating code blocks of different uh, sizes, uh, of different types. So we added NOP instructions, we added add, uh, subtract, multiply, and d I divide instructions. So the, the thing is that the ORAM access time dominates the time of a CPAD. And each CPAD is going to perform two ORAM operations. So because it dominates the time of the code block execution, what we see is from our statistical experiments, we see that the CPADs, irrespective of whatever they are, are more or less execute in the same amount of time. And the, since the assumption is that we're going to run the same number of CPADs, so the program itself would run for, uh, for consistently the same amount of time. But of course, this is a statistical experiment. Uh, we didn't do it with all possible uh, types of codes. But our, our, our uh, hope is that this is, this is a trend that would c continue showing in different programs. Yeah. 
Any other questions? Yeah, I think we are running out of time, so okay, cool. let's thank our speaker. Thanks.